Great. Good trailer, right? Quite sure, but <laughs> lots of love to our creative team. We have an amazing creative team that work really hard behind the scenes. They produce all of our trailers. So lots of love to them. But yeah, so this is part two of our series, Your New Normal, as Emily said. I should probably introduce myself first. I always forget that. In case you don't know who I am, there's lots of new faces in the studio tonight. So if you don't know who I am, my name is Alexia. I'm part of the student team. Um, so if you're a student, do come and introduce yourself, and I'd love to meet you. Even if you're in a pop-up, do find me on Instagram and get in touch, because I'd love to grab a coffee with you and get to know you and walk this journey with you. But, so, back into the talk. Okay, part two of our series, Your New Normal. Because that's where we are now, right? We've had this whole pandemic thing going on and we've kind of gone up the roller coaster. We've done the bit where it all changes, life's exciting, and then we're coming back into this place where we're accepting that this is normal now, right? This is normal, this is life. And we have to get used to it. We're going to have to adjust and we're doing a lot of adjusting to see what life looks like now. And actually, for a lot of us, life is a lot harder now than when it was before. For some of you, you got really used to working from home, and so getting up in the mornings now is really hard because you were used to just rolling out of bed five minutes before you need to start and get online. But now you're going back into the office a bit, you're going back into work, and so you're having to get up early. And so that is harder. Socializing is harder. You can only meet with six people. What happens if you have a group of seven friends? Awkward, someone can't come. It's tricky. Also, we got used to doing it on Zoom, didn't we? You could socialize with your friends from the comfort of your bed. Pint in your hand, and you didn't have to go anywhere. You didn't have to go out in the rain. Now it's getting darker. It's dark at like half five, and we have to go out now to meet people. It's harder. And for you students, lots of love to you students doing lectures online. It looks completely different, and it's a lot harder sitting at a laptop doing your lectures online. It's completely different, and it's a lot harder. And for some of us, faith has fallen into that same bracket. Faith looks a lot harder now. We, during lockdown, you maybe got into the routine of doing your quiet time every morning. You were really enjoying it, really getting into your Bible. But now your routine has filled up a bit. And so your quiet time has kind of slipped away. It's hard to find that time to be with God. Or maybe you're finding it really difficult not doing this whole corporate worship thing. And that was the thing that fed your soul, coming to church and singing with other people. That was what really pushed you on in your faith. That was what gave you strength. And you're finding it really hard not doing that. Or maybe, actually, even worse than that, life has just fallen apart. Maybe you're really struggling with your mental health. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe someone you love died. You feel like life has just fallen apart. There's all these little fires in your life. And you're just wondering, where is God in all of this? How do I hold on to faith if God doesn't feel like he's in any of this? My life is falling apart and God is not here, so why should I hold on to faith? And we know that life is really hard right now, but that is why we're doing this series. Because we want to be a people who win from this new normal. We don't want it to get us struck down to be crushed by it. We want to be people who win and thrive in this new normal. So we're doing this series. So, as Emily said, we're looking at the book of Daniel and Philip kicked us off last week and he gave us um, the context for the book of Daniel. So it's a book that we find in the Old Testament. And it's about this guy called Daniel and his three friends. And basically, what has happened is there's this king called Nebuchadnezzar who has come, who has taken them from their home, Jerusalem, and has taken them off to Babylon, where there are basically political exiles, and they are being forced to learn the way of the Babylonians and serve in their kingdom. Right? So for us right now, they give us a pretty a good idea of what life looks like when it gets completely flipped upside down and how to deal with that. So last week, Philip picked out two key words which set the whole scene for the whole of the book. And those two words were, but Daniel. If you were here last week, you'll remember those two words because Philip talked about being a but Christian. Who could forget? 
But if you didn't watch it, make sure you go online and catch up because it was such a good talk, really challenging, and you need to listen to the whole thing. My recap isn't good enough. Go and listen to the whole thing. But, so we had these words, but Daniel. And basically, Philip was saying, we need to be but Christians. We don't want to be so Christians. We don't want to be people who say, life is really hard, so I'm just going to give up. Life is really hard, and so I'm just going to give in to the ways of the world. We want to be people who are saying, yes, this has happened to me. Yes, this sucks. Yes, life is really hard. Yes, it's hold, hard to hold on to faith right now. But I'm going to stand strong. But I'm going to continue because God is good. And so we looked at Daniel and his friends being but Christians. And that's what we want to be, right? But we've just agreed that life is really hard right now. And sometimes it's hard to be a but Christian. And the brief that Philip gave me for this talk was basically, how do we remain faithful to God when absolutely everything against you? And I was thinking, I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know why I've been given this topic of how to remain a butt Christian when the world and everything is against you. That's a big topic, right? But we want to know. And I feel like I've got some answers for you. So hopefully, if you stick with me, I'll be able to give you some answers. Hopefully, maybe. But we're going to be looking at this story, which is found in Daniel 3. Actually, Daniel isn't in this story. It's just his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Interestingly, if you watched Philip talk last week, you saw that Daniel and his three friends were renamed by the Babylonians. And actually, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was the names that the Babylonians gave them, not their actual names. Their names which re-identified them, that tried to crush them. And so the Bible refers to them with their Babylonian names, which is really interesting. But we pick up the story from the beginning of chapter 3. And so the Bible writes this story so beautifully. So I'm not going to read you the whole thing because there's a lot of lists and a lot of descriptive imagery. But So I really encourage you to go home and read it yourself because it's such a good story. But let me just set the scene for you. So basically, where we pick up the story is at the beginning of chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar has built this massive image of gold. It's this image of gold that is 90 foot tall, which for some context is about the same height as Cabot Tower in Brandon Park. Now, if you're a fresher or you haven't even been to Bristol, you're watching online, you've never been to Bristol, I encourage you, go to Cabot Tower in Brandon Park. It's great. It's a really nice tower. Get a great view of Bristol. But it's flipping huge. So Nebuchadnezzar built this flipping huge, massive golden idol because basically he wants everyone in his kingdom to submit to his rule and reign. And so what he does is he builds this massive statue and he invites anyone who is anyone in his kingdom to come to the opening ceremony. And he says this, as soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Right, so from the beginning, we have our three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're in a little bit of a pickle because basically these guys come from Jerusalem and they are Israelites, which means they worship the God that we worship, right? He's called Yahweh. And Yahweh has given us these 10 commandments. The first three of which are basically, I'm your God, don't worship other gods, don't worship idols. So basically, Don't do what Nebuchadnezzar is asking you to do. Don't bow down and worship other things because they are not God, I am God. And so right from the beginning of this story, these three friends are faced with this dilemma of, what do I do? Do I bow down? God has asked me not to, but the king has told me that I must bow down. And to make matters worse, it comes with this warning. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Flip. That has got like 10 times more intense, right? They aren't meant to bow down, but if they don't bow down, they're going to get thrown into a blazing furnace. No one wants that. No one wants to be thrown into a blazing furnace, right? No, no one wants to be thrown into a blazing furnace. Thank you, the agreement from over there. Crowd participation. More of it, please. More of it. Come on. Just wake up. But, so, 
they're in this massive pickle. Basically, their choice is to be faithful to God and get thrown into a furnace or to give in and just to bow down. Actually, maybe our dilemmas in life don't look quite as drastic as that, but we do get faced with choices that feel really hard. Actually, sometimes God doesn't feel like the good option. Maybe for you, you are a fresher, you've just come to Bristol. Maybe you're even really new to faith and you've just moved into your flat and you want to tell your flatmates about your faith and about Jesus, but you've heard them talking badly about the CU and you've heard them talking and you know they don't agree with it. And so you don't want to ruin that chance of friendship. You know that making friends right now is really hard and actually you might get locked down with these guys. So you don't want to ruin that friendship. So what do you do? Or maybe at work, your manager wants you to tell this little white lie just to help you get out of this situation that's going to make life easier for everyone. But we, that's not what we believe is the right thing to do. And so if you don't go along with it, you could lose that good relationship that you have with your manager. And actually, jobs and employment and money is so important right now, and we don't want to put that at risk, right? Or maybe your mental health is really struggling. You're really struggling with it. And you said to God so many times, God, help me, where are you? And coming to church is really hard. Making that decision to come to church, even though you don't know where God is, feels really hard. It doesn't feel like the easy thing to do. And so when we get faced with decisions like this, like these three friends did, we basically get three choices, right? The first one is just to give in, just to hold your hands up and say, it's too hard. I can't do it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it just to give in and to bow down. These three, three friends could have just gone with the flow. Daniel wasn't with them. Daniel was like their ringleader. It was just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel wasn't with them. And everyone else was going to bow down. They were going to stick out like a sore thumb if they didn't bow down. So it would be easier. And they'd, they'd stay alive if they didn't bow down. So it's easier just to bow down, right? The other option we have is, actually, maybe we can make some kind of a deal with God. God didn't want these guys to die, right? Actually, if they were still alive, then they could make friends with the king. Maybe they could bring God into this situation. They could bring his rule and they could overcome it. Maybe that's how we feel at work. It's like, actually, if I, if I told that little white lie, it would be fine because I'd still be in this place and I could still bring the kingdom here. I can, like, God will forgive me for this one white lie. If I do this, that's only a small thing. If I bow down, God knows I'm not really bowing down in my heart. I'm just doing it to go along with everything else. But that's not what God wants us to do, right? He wants us to be but Christians. He wants us to be people who say, I will give everything, no matter how hard it is. I will not bow down. Even if it's death that's waiting for me on the other side, I will not bow down. But that seems really scary. And... For our guys in the story, they literally were faced with this choice of, do I remain faithful to God and be thrown into the furnace, or do I bow down? So, if we read on with the story, we'll see what happens. So basically, they're at this massive opening ceremony, and the king says, when you hear the music, you must bow down. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. They're but Christians. They've done it. They're but Christians. Come on, lads. This is good. Come on. They've done it. They're but Christians. They have decided that even though being faithful to God could cause them to be thrown into a blazing furnace, they've decided it was worth it. Now, some of you are thinking, what the heck? How have they done that? Like, I can't even get out of bed in the morning. I can't sacrifice my sleep to spend time with God. 
it's hard enough being faithful then. How on earth have they decided and remained faithful to God and but Christians when death is what they're facing? That's such a massive question. But I believe that if we look back at that verse, there's four words which show us. So it says, the God we serve. The God we serve. It's not the God of our fathers. It's not the God of our ancestors. It's not the God that we've read about in the Bible. It's not the God of Daniel. It's the God we serve. They have a personal relationship with God. And that's what makes all the difference. In any decision, a personal relationship will swing the balance. I promise you. Let me show you. So, when I was younger, I went to the Russell School Nursery, and I had this nursery teacher called Mrs. Pierce. She was lovely. Nicest lady in the world. She was super friendly, would always be there to give me a hug at the front door, would play with me, would be there for me when I was sad. Nicest lady in the world. Now, if I asked you if you would take a bullet for her, the answer is probably no, right? You probably you wouldn't do it. I'm not going to lie, I probably wouldn't either. If you're out there watching Miss Pierce, I don't know if you are, it'd be weird if you are, but if you are, I'm really sorry. I probably wouldn't. But what about your mum? You would probably say the same thing of your mum, right? Nicest person in the world, super friendly, super caring, always there for you. Would you take a bullet for your mum? Sam Cook says, absolutely, correct answer. <laughs> of course you would, without a doubt. No hesitation. You're going to take a bullet for your mum because it's all about relationship. It's relationship that causes us to be faithful. And the closer you are to someone, the more you're willing to sacrifice for them. It's all about relationship. It's not about trying harder. It's not about mustering up the energy to be a butt Christian. Actually, it comes from within. It comes from relationship. It's not about trying harder. We don't have to try harder to be faithful. It's all about relationship. So let me ask you, do you know Jesus? Do you really know Jesus? Do you have a personal relationship with him? Actually, maybe you're watching tonight and this is your first time in church and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. But it's so good that you're here. And as Metro, we'd love to walk that journey with you. We'd love to get, help you get to know him, to introduce you to him. And we do all sorts of things like Alpha that we run once a term and hubs and mentoring that can help you get into that relationship with Jesus. But for the Christians in the room, do you know Jesus? Is he your God or is he your parents' God? Is he your God or is he your friend's God? Is he some guy you've read about in the Bible? Some guy you've read about in theological textbooks? Or is he your God? Because a personal relationship looks like someone you hang out with just because you enjoy their presence. Someone you run to when times are hard. Someone you rejoice with when times are great. Someone that you know a lot about. Someone that you love to hang out with. Now, I have to confess that actually, I've had to do a lot of rethinking about this. For me, actually, I think he wasn't my God. He was the God of religion. I think I've fallen into the trap of being the God that I read the Bible for, the God that I go to church for. But actually, did I know Jesus for myself? Was he the person that I just love to hang out with, that I spent all my time with, that I ran to with everything? And actually, the answer was probably no. But that's okay, because it's opened up this whole new exciting adventure of getting to know Jesus for myself. Actually, really, really getting to know the person of Jesus for myself. And that is the best thing that we can ever do. And maybe you're wondering, actually... Yeah, maybe I feel the same. Maybe I feel a bit challenged by that. Actually, Jesus isn't someone who is on the same level as my best friend. 
but I want him to be. Actually, it's like any relationship. We just have to spend time, we have to listen, we have to talk, we have to communicate. We can spend time reading the Bible, but we need to get to know Jesus for ourselves. We need to get to know him in a personal, intimate relationship. And as I said, at Metro, there's so many ways that we can do that. You can get a mentor, you can join a hub. Come and join us in person on Sundays if you feel comfortable. But we need to get to know Jesus for ourselves. I don't want us to go through life knowing the Jesus that Philip talks about on a Sunday. Knowing the Jesus that we see our friends chatting to. I want you guys to know Jesus personally and intimately for ourselves. Because that is where faithfulness comes. God doesn't want us to be faithful. He wants relationship with us. But it's relationship that brings that faithfulness. And actually, when we're faithful to God, the best thing happens. The best thing happens. And if we read on in our passage, we'll see. So it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of his strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. What? I thought you just said... The best thing happens when we're, when we're faithful. That doesn't sound like the best thing. That sounds awful. <laughs> That's not how it's meant to go, right? That's not how it's meant to go. When we're faithful to God, he's meant to show up. He's meant to save us. He's meant to, go, he's meant to show up and save us. I know that's not why they were faithful to him, but he's meant to show up. Some of you are in that conversation with God right now. God, I thought you were good. I thought you worked all things for the good of those who love you. But I feel like I've just been thrown into the fire. I don't know where you are. I've lost my job. I've had to move home. I can't afford to pay rent. My family member died. My mental health is on the rocks. I've been thrown into the fire. God, where are you? You were meant to come and save me. And actually, we know that sometimes God does save. We've seen it. I'm sure you've seen it. Sometimes God does come and save us. But actually, being a Christian doesn't mean that God is always going to save us. If that's why you're here, then I'm sorry, because that is not the message of Christianity. God promises, actually, this life will be full of hardship and pain and trouble. And we know that it is. You just have to look around at the world right now. There's fires everywhere. There's fires in people's lives. People are going through hardship. But that doesn't mean that God isn't there. And actually, as I said, the best thing happens when we're faithful. Something even better than being saved from the fire. So if we read on, it says this. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw in the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now, this, this is amazing. Honestly, this is even better than being saved from the fire. So I'm going to get a little bit technical, so if you zone out, that's okay, but... Don't zone out for the rest of the talk, come back. But what happened there is basically what we call a theophany. This is an appearance of God. And this is in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, these appearances of God are super rare. They're really, really rare. And so for these three guys, they are one of the few people in the Old Testament who have experienced God in person. And it gets even better. Sometimes in the Old Testament, God will appear. We know that God appeared to Moses as a burning bush. I'm sure you've heard that story, even if you haven't been around church for a while. Also, 
he appeared to people as a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud when he led the Israelites. But in this instance, he appears as a man. And we know what God in human flesh is. It's Jesus. We believe that that is Jesus there with them in the fire. And Jesus is God's most precious gift to humanity. He is the way that we identify with him. God knew that we can't wrap our little brains around who God is. He's too big. And so he sent Jesus, God in human form, so we could understand him, so we could have relationship with him. Jesus is God's ultimate plan for saving humanity. He sent him, his one and only son, to die on the cross for us. And here he is in the fire, 600 years early, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They get to meet the person of Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds a whole lot better than being saved from the fire. Because in the fire, we find intimacy. We find intimacy in the fire. They get the most intimate experience of Jesus in the fire. Some experiences we can only have in the fire. If they had been saved from the fire, they wouldn't have experienced Jesus in this way. They wouldn't have found that intimacy. And that's what made it all worth it. That one intimate moment with Jesus, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, creator of the universe. They got to be with him in the fire. We find intimacy in the fire. And I know from my experience that that is true. Actually, about a month and a half ago, my aunt passed away. She had been fighting with cancer for about 17 years. And she was only 51. She's got two kids who are both 21. She died the day before her birthday, a week before her 25th wedding anniversary with my uncle. It's so unfair. It's not right. And actually, in that moment, I had to choose whether to be faithful to God, whether to say, it's too hard. If that's what life looks like, and if you're not in that, then I can't do it. Or I could say, God, it hurts, but I'm bringing it to you. But I choose to say that you are still good. And actually, one morning, as I sat on my bed reflecting on this all and crying out to God, processing the painful memories of her funeral, as I was just sat there, crying on my bed. I just felt the presence of God come. I felt his absolute peace, his absolute gentleness, and kindness, and goodness. And honestly, it made it all worth it. The intimacy in that moment with Jesus. I would do it all again. It hurts, it's uncomfortable, it's still really hard, but it makes it all worth it because Jesus comes through. Actually, in the fire, in those moments where we've chosen to be faithful, we find greater intimacy with God. And that's what some of you are longing for. You want more of God. You want greater intimacy with him. And actually, there's some experience of God. There's some intimacy that only comes through the fire. You really want that but you're scared. You're scared because life is unstable right now. Actually, is now the time to take a chance on God? Because what happens if he doesn't come through? But if we go back to the passage, we read it again, we can see that God comes through. It says, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. These guys were walking around in the fire and they were not bound and they were not harmed. The thing that was meant to kill them, the thing that was meant to crush them, it didn't have any power over them because Jesus was there with them. They were unbound 
and unharmed. And yet it was still probably incredibly uncomfortable. The furnace was heated seven times hotter than it should have been. So it was really hot in there. They were probably sweating. It was probably really smoky. It was definitely still uncomfortable. With my aunt, I still felt all the pain. It was still uncomfortable. But they were unbound and unharmed. Actually, in another part of the story, story we read that the soldiers that threw these three friends into the fire, the fire was so hot that it killed them. But it didn't kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were able to walk around in the fire unbound and unharmed. And actually, for some of you, that is literally why you're here today. Because you've seen your friend living in this place that looks like a fire, looks like they've got all these fires going on in their life, but they're okay. They have this incredible peace. They're not bound up by fear, paralyzed with anxiety. They're walking around and they are unbound and unharmed. In the story, King Nebuchadnezzar calls them out of the fire because he sees this amazing thing going on. What was meant to kill them didn't. They thrived in the fire, and he calls them out. Some of you, that's literally why you're here tonight, because you've seen that in your friend. You've seen them living through these hard times, unbound and unharmed, and you want that. You don't know what it is, but you want that. Our world is full of fires at the moment. There are so many people out there who are bound and harmed. And actually tonight we've seen that there is another way. We've seen that we don't have to let these circumstances get the most of us, to get the best of us, to bound us up, to harm us. But there are people out there who are hurting. We know that life right now is so hard and it's binding and hurting so many people. And so what we have is the most incredible gift that we can give to people. We can say, I can't put out your fire, but I can give you the gift of Jesus who will be there with you in the fire, who will not let you be bound, who will not let you be harmed, but will help you to thrive in that place. What an incredible gift to be able to give someone. It's not just about us being faithful. When we're faithful, we find that intimacy with Jesus, but actually we bring hope to a hurting world. People need hope right now. And if people see us walking around in the fire, and if we tell them why we're able to walk around in that fire, we can bring hope to the most hopeless situations. And we can bring them into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Because at the end of the day, like we said earlier, it's all about relationship with him. Jesus doesn't want us to be faithful He doesn't just want us to be faithful. He wants relationship with you. He wants intimacy with you. He wants to be able to protect you in in those fires. But that only happens when we choose to be completely, wholeheartedly, but Christians, faithful to him with everything that we have. And that's hard. And we're not going to get to that stage straight away. We're not going to get to the stage where we're going to say, God, I'm going to sacrifice everything for you. Because that is hard. But taking it a day at a time, choosing to be faithful to him in the small things, choosing to spend that time with him, to get to know him, to build that personal relationship with him. That is what allows us to be faithful in the bigger things. To be faithful even when the fires range around us, when they rage around our friends. To stand and say, I am not bound and I am not harmed and I will not let you 
be bound and I will not let you be harmed because there is a better way. There is Jesus and he will come and be with you in the fire. So this is our big idea. A personal relationship with Jesus produces faithfulness and that faithfulness brings a greater intimacy, allowing us to thrive in the fire and bring hope to others. So I'm going to invite the worship band up in a minute, but there's just a couple of groups of people that I want to pray for. Firstly, I want to pray for you if you don't know Jesus, if you don't have that personal relationship that allows you to thrive in the fire. I want to pray for you. And also, I want to pray for you if you feel like you're in the fire right now. I pray that you would know Jesus close and that you would be able to thrive in the fire and bring hope to others. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you that you are always faithful to us and that you allow us to be faithful to you. Yeah, God, we know it's hard and we know that life is really hard right now. But God, we want to choose to be but Christians. We want to choose to be faithful to you no matter what. Because we know that you are worth it. And Lord, I pray for all those people who don't know you yet. Lord, I pray that they would come to know you. They would enter into that personal relationship with you. Lord, I pray that they would know their personal saviour who loves them so much, who wants to be with them in those fires to help them thrive. And Lord, for everyone who's going through what feels like fire right now, Lord, I pray that they would know you close. They would know the person of Jesus intimately and personally. They would know that you are right there with them in the fire and that because of that, they will be unbound and unharmed. Lord, I proclaim that over them right now, that they will be unbound and unharmed by this situation. And Lord, for all of us, Lord, this week, I pray that we would find more intimacy in our relationship with you, that we would draw close into that personal relationship that we are able to have with you. Thank you that you help us to be faithful to you. Amen.